This is John Murray. He was ordinarily a rather reserved and quiet man, but everyone who knew him admired and respected him. For he was hardworking, conscientious, the kind of man you could count on. But for the last couple of months, something has been bothering John. Many times he has seemed neither happy in himself nor useful in his business. It has begun to worry the people closest to him, his wife, Catherine, and of course, his business partner, Dave. They don't know quite what to make of him lately. Something's the matter, John? Everything's the matter. We're washed up, might as well face it. We're not washed up. Losing that Higgins account doesn't mean we're ruined. It's our biggest account. It's my fault I shouldn't have been so ambitious. I'm not blaming you. Look, John, it isn't your fault any more than it's my fault that Higgins have closed out their local accounts. Everybody's been hit, not just us. This slum can't last forever. It just means we've got to work a little harder. I'm no use to this business. I can't concentrate anymore. It worries me so much I can't sleep at nights. Catherine says I ought to go to a doctor. It's foolishness. No doctor is going to fix a business that's going on the rocks. I'm going out to the wrong way. The people who work with him aren't worried about the business. They are worried about John. Say, Dave. Is Mr. Murray sick? I don't know. John's depression baffles his partner. Why should John feel that he has failed and that he is to blame? Hello? Hello, Catherine. I'm calling about John again. Yes, Dave, I know. He's still worrying himself sick over losing that Higgins account. He seems to think he's responsible and nothing I say will change But that was months ago. Besides, it had nothing to do with him. Higgins had to close all their local accounts. You know, Catherine, I think he's sick and won't admit it. I do, too. He doesn't sleep well, and he just picks at his food. I've tried to get him to a doctor, but he just says doctors can't cure a business that's going on. John is right, of course. No doctor can cure a business. But the trouble doesn't really lie in the business, but in John himself. And the doctor who will help him to recover will have to understand what John's life was like and what influences have shaped him. John had a happy infancy. He was the Murray's first child. With a look or a cry, he could command food, warmth, and comfort from mother. For a long time to come, he will have an absolute need of the love and security she affords him. For the time being, it was John's world indeed, and he was the center of it. Like any of us, he wouldn't want to dispute it with an intruder. Like the new baby mother brought home one day. Naturally, he was very curious about this little creature who seemed to be usurping his place as the only one. had lost his mother's love. He was too young to think clearly or understand clearly, but not too young to feel deeply. And his feelings often led him to interpret wrongly what he saw and heard. Simple, ordinary things. He woke up one night. The house was full of noises. You're not a well woman, and you've got to get somebody in to help you. We've been all through this before. You know we can't afford it. Why shouldn't we get Aunt Hilda? You've got to be sensible about this. I won't have that woman in my house. She's an old busybody, always sticking her nose into somebody else's That's bed. not true. I won't listen to you talk about her like that. Shh, you'll wake the baby. To John's mind, this seemed to mean... Daddy is not at Mama because Mama is sick. Mama said she had a lot of work to do. I wanted to help her. I liked helping Mama. Life had become such a burden to John's mother in her illness 
But she couldn't help being married. Oh, John, for heaven's sake, get out of here. You're just a nuisance to me. Go on outside. She didn't mean anything, but to John she meant. Go away from me. I don't love you. I love Bobby instead. Oh, Bobby, stop that racket. Outside it was wet and there's nobody to play with. Mama didn't want me in the house. A dog came. I was glad Daddy came. Daddy was always good to me. A nurse came to stay at our house. Aunt Hilda came to be housekeeper for the Murrays after all. John could see that she was kind and friendly to Bobby. He wanted someone to baby him too, for in his loneliness he needed a mother. Long ago he too was loved and fussed over. He will be a baby again. You dirty boy! Just look at your hand! Get right on up to the bathroom and clean yourself up. A big boy like you. His attempt to win affection by imitating his younger brother ends in failure, as such attempts always do eventually. John must learn not to retreat in the face of his loneliness, but to grow up. Grow up like Daddy. He didn't tell you to go away. He liked me to be with him. One Saturday morning, he even took me to the office. He just took me. He made Bobby stay home with Auntie. John had lost his mother, and Auntie had failed to take her place. He looked to his father for everything he didn't get from the others. Okay, Bill, I'll be right over. Bye. Johnny, you stay here and mind the office, eh? The office was a swell place. The people were so nice, they even knew my name. Good morning, Mr. Mary. Good morning. Someday I'm going to be just like Daddy and do everything just like he does. And when I get big, I'm going to work in the office, too. Acme Paper Company. Hello? Acme Paper Company. <clears throat> Hello? This is the Acme Paper Company. Hello? It's just some kid playing. Daddy never gets mad at you. Not really mad, whatever you do. Why, you little rascal. Sometimes he pretends, but that's just free. Daddy was perhaps too important for John. As the one remaining source of security and love, John has made him both father and mother. Someday Daddy, being human, will fall short of the enormous emotional demands that John has imposed upon him. He never forgot one day. In the winter, I made a snow house. I worked every day after school making it. Now it was ready. It was just big enough for me to sit inside. It was a beautiful lake. I just needed one more thing. I want to get it from Andy.
to my room. She said Daddy would thrash me. It was Bobby's fault. He broke my house. Daddy should get after him. You'll know it was Bobby. at all. He just acted like a crazy thing. Really, you'll have to do something about that child. I'm sure I can't manage him. I'll look after him. He doesn't know. He didn't even try to find out. You've hurt your brother. I'm going to teach you a lesson, so you'll never do that again. Go to my room. That was the only time his father beat him. John never forgot that lesson. And John never really forgave his father. There were many happy times, of course. James Murray always tried to be a good father to his boys. But John never felt quite the same about him again. It would be almost impossible for any father to satisfy the unending emotional needs of such an insecure child as John. By the time John was in college, though supported by his father, he did not suppress a growing revolt against him. He keeps telling me I should take a commerce course, just like my dad. You know, he still thinks I'm going into the business with him, sort of follow in his footsteps. You should see him. He pokes around the office all day and comes home and has supper and then says, well, I guess I better go back to work. See, he's got nothing else to do. Uh, that's the sort of thing they want to get me into. Mm -mm. Not for me. He's always kidding me about writing. What he doesn't know is that someday I'm going to be a writer. You going up to see him now? Sure. I'll be right back. John's dreams were very different now, and he despised a father who couldn't share them. He couldn't seem to help irritating his father sometimes. I'll work on it over the weekend. Yes, I'll see if I can get it out to you first thing Monday morning. Goodbye. What brings you to the office, John? I hate to bother you, but could you let me have five dollars? Let's see. Two, four, Five. There you are. Thanks. What's it for? Are you going to buy another one of those books of yours? What's the matter with buying books? Anyway, I'm going to a show tonight. It must be quite a show. John! John, I don't mind giving you money, but you must remember, it doesn't grow on trees these days. I know. I'm going to pay you back. Bye, John. Bye. Within a year, James Murray was dead. He left no insurance and very little in the bank. He had not been a very successful businessman of recent years, and it was a great sacrifice for him to keep John at school. John had to leave college and go to work in the office. Thank you. I was wondering how you were getting on with night school, John. All right, I guess. I suppose you find it quite a change after college, eh? Oh, I don't mind that so much. Somebody has to look after Bob. You know, I can't get over Dad. 
I used to make fun of him sometimes for working so hard. Things like that. It was for me and Bob. I didn't know. If you don't... I didn't know. With his new responsibilities, John has put aside his old ambitions. However, he could help Bob to realize his. In a way, he became a father to Bob. He was happy helping him and sharing his successes. I remember that. Memorizing's easy if you get the sense of it. Let's see. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears and sometime voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming, the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me. But when I waked, I cried to dream again. Go on. Can't tonight, I'm afraid I've got that exam in business law. Contracts. You know what a contract is? A contract is an agreement between two or more parties to do or not to do a certain transaction or service for... Uh, you wouldn't uh, have to work every night if you hadn't wasted all your time on them poems and nonsense and taking that course that your father wanted you to. I used to say to your father, you give him his own way too much. If you'd paid more attention to him, heaven knows. But it's too late for that now. Bob was a very clever boy. Helped by John's coaching, he won a small scholarship which took him away to a distant university. John still had to support him financially. John was proud, of course. Bob's success, in a way, was his own success. But he felt empty and desolate to see departing the only person in the world for whom he felt any warm affection. He didn't know yet how hard it was going to be to enjoy his brother's successes at long distance. When Bob came home for the Christmas holiday, he found that John had changed. One night, there was to be a party. Come on, hurry up. We're going to be late. I'm not going. What? I've got work to do. Hey, when are you two guys coming? Okay, we'll be right out. Come on, get your things on and hurry up. You go with them. They're your friends, not mine. Oh, for Pete's sake, you've known Tom and Janet ever Look, since. Look, I've got work to do, that's all. Nobody has to work that hard. You go on. Have a good time. I sure will. With his self-sacrificing attitude, he has succeeded only in marring his brother's happiness and his own. Does he enjoy staying home alone, cutting himself off from any sort of ordinary pleasure? I heard what you said. My, I'm glad you're not going to get mixed up with these modern girls. They're not what they were in my day. You know, Mrs. Thurston was telling me just the other day about a fine, hard-working young man. Took up with the girls, spent money on her like water. And what do you think she did? She ups and leaves them for a no-good that hasn't got two nickels to rub together. I know, Andy. Women are all the same. Well, that's not a very nice thing to say. As the years passed, John seemed to have chosen for himself a lonely and austere life. Most nights he worked, but without any very definite aim in mind. Sounds silly to say it, but really it seems too good to be true. 
Well, say something, Johnny. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm very glad, Bud. I'm sorry to be spending our money on long distance like this, but it's once in a lifetime, and I couldn't wait to tell you. See you on the 17th, okay? Sure, I'll write you tonight. Goodbye, Johnny. Bye. It was wonderful news. John's years of sacrifice had been worth it, after all. But Bob no longer needed him, and he could no longer claim his share of Bob's successes and happiness. Nobody needed him. He was finally alone. He wanted to rejoice in Bob's good fortune, but he felt tense and anxious and suddenly very sad. He couldn't understand the way he felt. Next morning, he had no heart for his work. The crust of routine couldn't hide from him a suddenly aroused hunger for a warm human relationship. Mr. Murray? Yes? I thought you didn't look yourself this morning. Perhaps you'd like a cup of coffee. That's very kind of you. Oh, it's nothing. Did you want me for anything else right now? No, I don't think so. I'll go to lunch then. Her simple, kindly gesture stirred him tremendously. Miss Simmons, I wonder, would you like to go to lunch with me? Why, yes, that would be very nice. I'll get my hat. Well, blow me down. Six months later, John and Catherine were married. Catherine satisfied his longing for affection and kindness, so often frustrated in the past, and he was happier than he had been in a long time. But John was not yet securely at peace with himself. As long as the routines of everyday life flowed smoothly, John would be all right but he sometimes felt that he didn't deserve his happiness. Thank you, John. Hello, Catherine. Of course, he was always something of a warrior. For some time now, he had been worrying about business conditions. There was a general recession which had begun to affect John's firm. There's a parcel for you, John, from Bob. Might be his book. War and Peace, a critical study by Robert James Murray. This book is a promise that we may expect great things from Mr. Murray. Isn't that wonderful, John? Janet's going to have a baby next month. They're very lucky people, aren't they, John? Yeah. That night, John couldn't get to sleep. He felt disturbed and angry with himself. The next day, though usually punctual, he was late getting to the office. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, John. I'm afraid there's bad news. I tried to get you by phone, but I guess you'd already left. Hagen's man was in. He says things are so bad with them, they've decided to close out their local account with us. Twelve years trying to make something out of this business. And this has to happen. Hello. Just one minute, please. It's for you, John. It's no use. Could you call later? Thanks. 
to Murray. Don't worry. He'll get over it. But John didn't. A month later, he was still suffering periods of great despondency. He seemed to have lost interest in his work, and at home he often worried and upset Catherine. Yes. Yes, I'll have him call you. Yes. Goodbye. Where on earth have you been, John? Out. Out where? Why didn't you telephone? You know I've been keeping dinner since 6 o'clock. Went to a show. Afterwards, I went for a walk. Why did you take me? Didn't know whether you wanted to go with me or not. Oh, for heaven's sake, of course I'd want to go with you. Why on earth not? Well, I thought you might be tired of having me around all the time. Sometimes I don't want to bother with me at all. So many other people smarter and more interesting. Why do you say such silly things? Now look, you know I love you. Don't be such a baby. To the people close to him, John has become a mystery. He loves his wife and his work, yet he seems to be inviting disaster with both. Dave and Catherine have tried to reason with him, but he exasperates them. As they say, he won't listen to reason. He will not because his difficulty lies not in his reason or intelligence, but far back in his emotional history. Through his depression, he is hurting himself. To put it another way, he is punishing himself because he feels guilty. The world and John are aware only of his conscious self, the generous, self-sacrificing man who has worked so hard to further the interests of his brother. The world cannot see and John cannot allow himself to be aware of the buried resentment which all his life he has borne towards his brother. He has learned to bury these feelings of jealousy and resentment, but they can still be stirred up by events. When John's business reverses coincide with his brother's final success, he becomes victim of a struggle with conscience. The struggle shows itself as depression. Its main victim is John himself. By blaming business conditions for all his troubles, he is really attempting to stifle a dim, unwelcome voice that says, I am guilty of mean and base feelings towards my own brother, therefore I do not really deserve to be esteemed and loved. The punishment which John most fears is the withdrawal of love. For in him there is a desperate longing for affection, which he has found hard to satisfy ever since early childhood. Now he has almost got it but he cannot really enjoy what he dimly feels he doesn't deserve. But his story need not be a sad one. He may even recover from his depression spontaneously. But usually a man like John needs help. Psychiatry has growing resources for helping him. It can help him to understand himself and his history. And with this understanding, he will find his way towards a fruitful release of his rich abilities and his long repressed capacity for enjoyment and warmth and happiness. And he will be able to share that happiness in a freer and more enduring way with those whom, in his fumbling way, he has loved so much.